think that you have a, you know, a rough idea of what Ezekiel is all about, you know, as we go from chapter 1 all the way to now chapter 11, okay? Now, uh, we're going to do chapter 12 and 13 today. Uh, chapter 12 and 13 is a very interesting chapter because it, it talks about Ezekiel still talking about the idol. The idol that the, the leaders and the people have worshipped. Uh, obviously, it talks about the, you know, the hard heart of the people you know, uh, in Ezekiel 11. Uh, and, um, and then he says that uh, because you have done so, um, therefore, uh, God will judge you. Okay? In the mind of the Israelite, they were thinking that God is going to come to save them. God is going to come to relieve them from their suffering. But, but then God is saying, I'm against you, I'm against you. I'm going to put judgment and my judgment is going to come. Uh, very uh, yeah, quite immediate. You know that chapter one, uh, we we saw the call of Ezekiel, and then uh, chapter two uh, and chapter three, we see the glory of God coming and uh, summoning him to do what God wants him to do. And then we come to chapter four. He actually um, uh, gave uh, a picture about the siege of Jerusalem, which going to happen seven years down the road after his prophecy. And, and he was asked to lie down, remember, a certain amount of days on the left and on the right. And then he was asked to cook uh, his food in feces, in, uh, in, um, okay, in feces, just to mimic or just to tell the people that, hey, at the siege is going to be difficult. You know, uh, there will be, there will be uh, things like that's happening. Uh, you know, the siege is going to happen uh, and the enemy is going to come. And then he says, you lie down on the left and right and then you build the, like a Lego set about how the siege is going to happen. So he, he does this, okay? Um, that is in chapter 3, okay? Chapter 3, um, ch chapter 4, okay? So that's in chapter 4, okay? I just roughly go through with you uh, so that to refresh your mind a little bit. That's in chapter 4, the siege is symbolized. And then he says that uh, in chapter 5, how Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And then chapter 6 and 7, he's, he's going to talk about the idolatry. He says, remember, destroy all those high places. Uh, those high places that you have erected, you know. Uh, and he talks about the high places and how the judgment of God is going to come. And he says, um, in, then in chapter 8, he, then a, another set of vision came for him. Uh, uh, Ezekiel was plucked out from uh, Babylon to Jerusalem. And he says, son of man, go and see what is happening. And he brought him into actually the temple to see the abomination in the temple. Remember, he saw what the leaders are doing. He dug a hole and he saw that they were worshipping idols. You know, their heart is not right. That's in chapter 8 uh, and chapter 9 uh, and chapter 10. Uh, that, uh, the, um, that God is telling him, tell the people that if you continue to sin, my glory is going to leave. And in chapter 10, we see God's glory living, right? And then uh, in chapter 11, he says that you have put idols in your heart because remember that verse in 11, 19, he says um, that I will give them one heart and new spirit I put within them and uh, uh, um, uh, I, I, put, I, I will put within them, I will remove their heart of stone and their heart of flesh. So you know that they are very hard in their heart and God has always called them the rebellious house. Now in all this chapter 1 to 11, we see that there's one thing that recurs um, uh, rapidly or uh, uh, many times. In fact, 56 times. I am the Lord or I am Yahweh. I'm doing all this because I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. So God, like I say in the book of Nahum, that he is a jealous God. He does not want you to worship other God. So therefore, he will tell the people always 56 times in the whole book. He's going to remind the people I am Yahweh or I am the Lord. Okay? Now, Obviously, God uh, know that they have forsaken Him. Uh, and chapter 8 onwards to chapter 11, uh, the theme would be nothing escaped the Lord's notice. Because the people always think that, hey, I can do everything. God doesn't care anymore. God has forsaken the land. For example, in chapter 8 verse 12, Chapter 8, verse 12. I'm, I'm just going to read to you what is the perception of the people, yeah? Chapter 8, verse 12. Um, it, then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house, have you seen, sorry, 
eight twelve. Huh? Then he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in their dark ish in his room of picture? For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has not has forsaken the land. This is the perception of the people. The Lord, the, the Lord's eyes is not upon us anymore. The Lord has forsaken us. In the time of Sish, in the time of the uh, downfall of Babylon, God has forsaken. So that was the perception. And how can God forsake his people? How can God allow the temple to fall? Chapter 9, verse 9, similar thing. The perception of the mind of the people. Then he said to me, the guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great. The land is full of blood and the city full of injustice. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see us. So the Lord has forsaken the land, the Lord does not see us. Okay, uh, at chapter 11, we you know, like in verse 3 itself, when he gave another picture about uh, the, uh, the Jerusalem uh, is, uh, is the pot uh, and you are the meat. And he says that, remember the meat that's in the pot is the, the, the meat that's, that's useful, chapter 11. If the meat outside the pot, it is not useful anymore because it's raw meat. Only the meat that you put into the pot is useful. So it, he's actually illustrating that the pot is actually Jerusalem itself or the protection of God and you are the meat in it. But he says now you are the meat outside the pot. You are, you are no longer uh, useful. That's chapter 11. So here is also said, here God is also telling them that hey, you know that don't think that the protection of God is going to be there forever and ever. They also think that God doesn't see them or God has forsaken them. Uh, uh, just let me refresh you a bit. Uh, but we see that God is patient, you know, and when we come to chapter 12, we know why the people did not see God or did not think that God is there. Look at verse 12, okay? The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. So this is a rebellious house. Now, this is not the first time he said you are rebellious. Because when God called him in Ezekiel chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you remember he says, I am going to send you to what? The house that's going to not hear the message, the house that's going to rebel against you. These are going to be people with a heart headed, but I will make your head harder than them. If you remember the call that God God tell him. And he says that you are going to face trouble. Now you are going to be sent to a place where people do not uh, even listen to you. Now that is a very difficult ministry uh, to do, yeah? Okay? So they are rebellious people. And look at what he says in chapter 12 verse 2. He says that you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but not see, but see not, who have ears to hear but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Eyes to see and not see, ears to hear and not, uh, they have ears but not hear, they have eyes to see but not see. So what is, what, what is this rebellious people doing? They are selecting what they want to hear and what they want to see. In the NLT, it says, they have ear, but they refuse to hear. They have eyes, but they refuse to see. Now, you have eyes. If you refuse to see the truth, then you refuse to see the truth. This is the problem. It's not that they have, don't, don't have eyes. It's not that they don't have prophet. They have prophet. They have people coming to tell them. But they chose not to see. Why? When we bring our memory back to 11, chapter 19, then we know that their heart is a heart of stone. They, they, they think that God has forsaken them. Or some of them think that God don't see. Oh, I can do things in the dark. Oh, son of man, go and dig the wall in the temple. Go into the inner chamber and see what is going on. And they see the abomination, the idolatry of the heart life of the people. And these are the things that is holding the nation or holding the people so ingrained that they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. So how are they responding to the word? That is the big question in chapter 11. Now how do we respond to the word when we hear and when we see? Some will deny, some will distort, some do not believe, some believe. Uh, so we are asked to stay on course, deliver the things that we want to deliver, obey God at, at um, obey God no matter what it costs us. Now, that is two problems. One is about the people who hear and the other one is about you who preach. So if you have people who don't hear, people who reject you, people who don't see, what are you going to do? Do you give up? So the chapter tells us that as God people, we stay the course. We deliver, we obey no matter what it costs us. That is the call to you. 
But the call to the people, you must understand that they have eyes, they, they refuse to see, they have ears, they refuse to hear. Now, how are people responding to God's word? Um, it's a little bit dark, but I already sent you the notes so you know. Yeah? No, 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 it's okay. They have the notes. Yeah. Uh, they can download the notes, okay? Um, like Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 22, the rich young ruler, he, uh, he obviously reject the word and walk away. Acts 24, 24 to 26, Felix do not want to deal with what he heard and thought another way to respond. So these are people that reject. But you look at Mary in Luke 138, when the angels came to her, uh, she, after the angel says that you will be pregnant, God will come upon you and you will bear the son. And what did Mary say? May it be done to me according to your word. And Ezekiel 12 to 13, we see the people who hear the word of the Lord, um, and the word of the Lord does say the Lord comes six times. But six times in chapter 12, I bring you to the last chapter, chapter 12 verse 27, the, the, the very last, the second last verse, and look at what they say. After God gave them another two message, after he said, does say the Lord many times, and look at chapter 27, what do you say? Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say, the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesied of time far off. This is the people. Whatever you prophesy is going to be days ahead. I, I don't need to worry. I just worry about today. Whether I have food, whether I have life, whether I am enjoying myself, that's all. Because he says the prophecy of this time is far off and many days from now. That is in the mind of the people. Now I turn, I, you just go back a little bit, a few words before that. After he deliver his, in okay, in chapter 12, he's going to deliver two pictures again. Just like how he going, that he did in chapter 4, where he was asked to do a sign act. So he's going to do two sign act again, but people reject the sign act. Look at uh, verse 20, uh, chapter 12, verse 21, 21. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you have about the land of Israel saying? Now, there is a proverb. There is a thing that going on in their mind, even before, um, you know, uh, this word came, okay? Now, what is this proverb, or what is this saying? The days grow long, and every vision comes to nothing. In their mind, they already refuse to see. They already refuse to hear, because it says it comes to nothing. They don't believe in the word of the Lord anymore, because of the harden of their heart, as, as Ezekiel built his case from chapter 8, Chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, you can see how hard or how rebellious the people are. Now you are going to face with those people out in the street when you preach the gospel. So how are you going to react? Alright? So there are people who will accept, like Mary. There are people who are going to reject, like the rich young ruler or Felix. Or people that's going to reject the gospel. Okay? Now how are we to respond to God's word? Can others see that God's word is... A priority in our lives. Can can others see that God's word is priority to us? When God word comes to you, can can people see? Can unbelievers see that you the, the word is priority to you? That, that's the question, no? You need to take heed of how you yourself respond to the word. Do you have eyes that was that have seen or continue to see, or do you have ears that have heard and continue to hear? That, that is the question. Are we faithful at all costs to obey and preach the word? Is our joyful submission to what he says evident? Are we, are, we, are we able to obey and preach the word in season out of season? That's what it means. The other question, are there any ways that we who are believers are denying or disregarding or distorting to even or even disbelieving in his word, especially prophetic word? Do we reject prophetic? Now there are prophetic that, that that after in chapter 13, we will see it comes from the false teacher or false prophet. Now those we need to reject. But there are ways that we can reject and know those are false. But do we reject a uh, good prophecy, a, a word from the Lord? That, that's the question. Are we denying it? Are we disregarding it? Are we distorting it or even disbelieving it? Okay, so, if, so these are the few questions that we need to ask up front. Now, may the Lord grant us every desire in us to obey His message and in particular to delight in the greatest word He has spoken to us, Jesus, that is Christ. Now, we need to know and have this desire to continue to want 
the very word of God to immerse in us, to change us so that we can be the vessel, you know, to preach the gospel uh, to the lost, okay? So, do, so we pray that God grant you that desire, okay? Now, this is how I look at Ezekiel 12, 13, or even Ezekiel 1 to 13, as we mentioned. I believe that this is the, the season of grace. Remember 2 Chronicles 7, 14? I call it the 4-3 principle. The four things uh, that you will do and the three things that God will do. See, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek, and turn, this is your duty. If my people humble themselves, pray, seek, and turn from their wicked ways, then God said, if you do the four things, I give you the three things. What is the three things in Ezekiel 2 Chronicles 7, 14? Then he says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now these promises stay true to us. This is the period of grace. So when you quote 2 Chronicles 7, 14, you tell yourself the four three principle, the four things I must do so that the three things God will do because I do the four things, okay? This, uh, this is grace. This is now. The situation now is that the world has grieved God. Many people are disobedient. Many people are going against God. You see government, you see, I don't need to tell you what the world has become. So that is now. So now it matters more to preach the gospel because of the grace that God has given unto us. So now is that you must obey, you must believe, you must speak the word. Okay? So we are living in a crucial time. Now this is the time that Ezekiel is saying to us, and it happened seven years after his prophecy, the, the downfall of the people of God. But if we continue to sin against God like that today, then the world is going to be doomed. So Ezekiel, although he talks about seven years later, he doesn't know, maybe, but he knows that Jerusalem is going to fall. But yet he faithfully preached the word. He says that if you obey, God will forgive you. If you don't obey, then God will punish you. But with the things that he has seen and God has shown him, he says, hey, Jerusalemite, you have sinned against God and God cannot tolerate. God is grief. We are in this season that God is grief. Now, when is this coming? I don't know. Can be tomorrow, can be 1,000 years, can be 100 years from now, can be next year, can be next day or whatever. But the future judgment, let's not think that, yes, it's grace-filled, but I believe that it's going to be imminent, it's going to have, it's going to expire in a day in our life or even maybe in the days of our children's life but we are not to take for granted as the people of god we are to preach as the people of god we have to be obedient if god calls you to a uh, rebellious people are you going to be to be doing the things like ezekiel does if god calls you to do a sign act are you going to do the sign act for god now doing the sign act is not easy people think that he's crazy lying on his left, lying on his right, putting, uh, uh, cooking his food in the feces, and today, we're going to see him doing two more sign acts, which is ridiculous. What is this guy doing? People think that, hey, this is a, a stupid guy, you know, what is he actually doing? But he's actually portraying the message. Today, as I end this session, I want to tell you right from the beginning, today, the, the sign acts, the greatest sign acts is in you. Jesus died on the cross. It's the sign act, the message itself. And it is in you. So therefore, you are to portray or do that sign act. Or portraying and tell people about Jesus Christ, that message, that act, that how God died for you, okay? This will come at the conclusion. But this judgment is future. But this judgment, I believe, is not going to be delayed much longer. Because God is grief. God timetable is getting nearer and nearer to this day. I will now do everything I have threatened. This is the word that Lord, the Lord God said to the people of Jerusalem, if you read Ezekiel. I will do it now. Whatever I threaten, I'm against you, I will do it. I will fulfill my threat of destruction in your own lifetime. That's what he says. In your lifetime, Ezekiel tells them, you will see God's destruction coming upon you. 
So this one is in future. So what, are, what is the time frame we are living in? A grace-filled time. But do we take it for granted that we are living in a grace-filled time? Means God will always forgive, hear, forgive, and heal. This message is countering this message. Do you see the opposite of this message? This message is, now I'm going to judge you. This message it says, if you do these four things, I will give you these three things. But does the word of God nullify one another? No. This is the period of grace. But we need to understand this grace. We need to know that we hold the greatest sign act that we need to preach that grace. And we need to know that, hey, if the world continues to go on like this, this grace will expire. And this, this judgment will come. But eventually it will come. It will come. But then the question is, what are you going to do with the world? What are you going, what is God challenging you to do? You know, when you live in this period and seeing people that are not safe, your loved ones, people that is near to you, close to you, all right? So this is how we would paint the picture. So the picture of judgment and the picture of grace, the picture of judgment and the picture of hope embed in the world that we are living today. The season that we are in. So, brothers and sisters, you are living in a very crucial moment. The life of the people, the future of the world depends on the Christian. You think so? I think so. It depends on your prayer. It depends on your work. It depends on your desire to obey, desire to go out, desire to preach. Okay? So this is how I will look at judgment grace and hope in the in the schematic of the whole scripture all right now oops can i see okay now this is in chapter 12 verse 2 um they have eyes but they do not see they have ears but they do not hear okay for they are a rebellious house now after you have said this word uh from from verse uh four onwards to verse six okay uh, actually from verse sorry from okay from 12 uh, verse 3 to verse 7 he's going to bring the first sign act okay and 12 uh, and then in verse 8 to 17 he's going to explain what the sign act mean and from 18 to 20 is the second sign act okay so remember first act is in 3 to 7 then he's going to explain in verse 8 to 17 what is the meaning of the act and then in 18 to 20, he's going to tell you the second act. Okay, let's look at the first act. What is this first act? Okay, let's look at verse 3. Okay, verse 3, huh? Verse 3, okay? First act, verse 3. Second act, uh, verse 8, okay? All right, let's look at verse 3. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an extra baggage. So take a knapsack, take a, take a baggage, and go into exile by day in their sight. That means he has to take a bag and walk out and, and, and pretend like he's going somewhere. Uh, okay, like this. Okay? He's taking a bag, okay, walking out of the city. Okay? Now let's see. Okay? Um, you shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are rebellious house. So you are going to act out as they. Like that, they are escaping during the time of siege, okay? Verse 4, you shall bring out your luggage by day in their sight. That means in the morning, you, you, you prepare the luggage, bring out the luggage as, as baggage for the exile, and you shall go out for yourself in the evening in their sight as those, as those do who must go into exile. So what he is asked to do, early morning, you prepare a knapsack, like you are going out but you are going out like the exile people going out. And then he says, but you actually only go out at night. You, okay, that's why he says in verse 4, you actually go out in the evening, okay, and then verse 5, in their sight, dig through the wall. Now he's asked to dig again, okay? And bring your baggage out through it. It's not exiting out from the front gate, but dig a wall and, and then go out. That's what he says, okay? Uh, okay? Verse 6, in their sight you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulder, put on your shoulder, and carry it out at dusk. That means as the nightfall in the evening. You shall cover your face that you may not see the land. 
blindfold yourself so that you don't see the land. Okay, what is he trying to tell us? He's trying to tell us that, hey, this is how they're going to escape. Or this is how they, they're going to run out. Or this is how, sorry, not escape, sorry. I repeat, this is how they, the exile is going to go out. Not through the main door, but through a dark uh, a, a hole. Okay, at night, dark, face covered, so that they don't see the land. Okay, now let's, let's read on. Huh? You shall cover your face that you may not see the land, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. Now let's look at the explanation from verse 7, uh, from verse 8 onwards, huh? from verse 7 onwards, all the way to verse 17. Let's, he's going to explain to you. Oh, sorry, verse 7, he's going to do the thing. Huh? Let's, let's look at what he do. As I did, as I was commanded, now he's going to do it. I brought out my baggage by day. Just now he was instructed, now he do it. Huh? And he says that I brought out my baggage by day as baggage for exile. And in the evening, I dug through the wall with my own hand, as what the Lord instructed. I brought out my baggage at dusk, at the, uh, at the evening, carrying it on my shoulder in their sight. Now, that was eight. Now he's going to explain. Look at how he's going to explain this, okay? In the morning, the word of the Lord came to me. Now, the word of the Lord came to me came many times. You will see as the word come, but the people fail to see, huh? Okay. In the morning, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? Now, very interesting. As he carried out this thing, the people say, hey, what are you doing? That means they have eyes, they refuse to see, ears, they refuse to hear. Now, if you take verse 3 all the way to verse 7, you will see this word repeating, repeating as they watch, as they watch. You know, when you do this, they will watch, they will see. Now, there is a very interesting way. He starts off with saying that they, are, they have eyes don't see, ears don't hear, and then from verse 7, about verse 3 to verse 7, he always says this, you do this, they will watch. You do this, they will see. But actually, they don't see. And then, when he comes to verse 8, he says, hey, look, the rebellious house will ask you, what are you doing? That means, they don't see, they don't hear, Okay. That's in, that's in verse 8. Let's read on. Um, that is in verse 9, sorry. Verse 10. Say to them, okay, if they say, what are you doing? Say to them, thus say the Lord God, this oracle or this burden or this, or this, um, uh, this act, okay, concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Now, who is the prince of Jerusalem? The prince of Jerusalem is Zedekiah. He is not called a king because when the first deportation, when Nebuchadnezzar entered the land, he disposed uh, the king, he put a puppet ruler. His name is Jehoiachin. Now he, this guy is called a prince, although he has a legit, legitimate claim to the throne. But he was just made a puppet king. Okay, he, made, he was made a puppet king, okay? So he was supposed to what? To collect tax from the people and give to Babylon. He was, he, that was his role. But the problem is that he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. That's why Nebuchadnezzar killed him, okay? We will see the, the story afterwards, huh? Now here he says, this oracle concerning the king, okay? Now, obviously he says the king and the people because he says, the house of Israel. Now, yes, it depicts the king, but it also depicts the, uh, the, the king actually represents the people, so it depicts the people, okay? So you've got, you got to take note, huh? let's read on and see, okay? Verse 11, Say, I am a sign for you, as I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. That means this prince and all the people of Israel will go into exile. And the prince who is among them shall leave his baggage upon his shoulder at dusk. So the, he is actually going to play the role of the prince, lifting the baggage and going out blindfold. Okay? Now, he's going to put the baggage upon his shoulder at dusk and shall go out. They shall dig through the hole. Who is they? He and his helper. Okay? To bring him out through it, he shall cover his face, so you know who this is. He's actually uh, mimicking the king, or, or, sorry, the prince. He will cover his face, and he may not see the land with his eyes. And I will spread my neck over him. 
this is the king, uh, uh, the prince, uh, and he shall be taken in my snare. So he's going to be trapped, okay? And I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, and he shall die there. Okay? Now, the Lord is going to, in that sense, kill Zedekiah, which is true. Historical say that he actually colluded with the enemy of Nebuchadnezzar, trying to free himself from Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar found out, okay, and when he pressured uh, Jerusalem, um, he, he, uh, Zedekiah wanted to escape. He sent his troop, caught him, caught him, blinded his eyes, killed his two sons, and the last thing that he see in his, uh, in his sight was the killing of the two sons. So, Nebuchadnezzar is a very ruthless king. He asked the guard to kill the son in front of his father and then blinded his eyes. And then, and then take him to Babylon and he, uh, and he died there. In, uh, uh, this is recorded in 2 Kings 25, 4-7. Now, in 2 Kings 25, 4-7, it, uh, it is a historical account in the book of Kings to tell the fate of Zedekiah, how he tried to escape through obviously like a hole in, at night in the dark and then he was caught, his son is killed and he was blinded. But in the second king, uh, chapter 25, he did not say that he died. He just said that uh, Nebuchadnezzar blinded his eyes. So now you must understand, when Ezekiel preached this, same story, but he says that he's going to be what? Um, he's going to be taken to Babylon, he shall not see he shall not see the land again and he shall die there and very interesting he he's, he 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 pictured it out as though as he's blindfolded like he cannot see anymore so is is it now the ezekiel message and the second king historical message uh second king recording uh, is more or less the same in that sense it tells the same story but the only thing that ezekiel say that ezekiel said that hezekiah is going to die uh, Zedekiah is going to die in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the exile. So the people get a little bit confused because, well, okay, uh, what is this message? Is he going to die? Is it about the prince? You know, is it about the people? So here, it is clearly telling us that, hey, he is going to be taken, uh, he's going to be taken to exile and he will die. And this is going to happen seven years later. And then later, there were, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, they found out that there is also a mention in the book of Kings about the fate of this king. So you see how prophetic word works in the life, you know, of the people. And God has warned them that this king is going to rebel, this king, because of the sin of the people, uh, this is what's going to happen. Now, what is uh, the king or the prince represent? The people. Although it's the fate of the king, and the fate, sorry, the fate of the prince, and it happens exactly what it is historically. But it is about the people. It is about that they are so blind that they cannot see, they cannot hear. They are going to be taken out to exile. Like a blindfolded man, blind like the, the prince, and never see the land again. Never see the land again. And if they continue to be disobedient, they will die in exile. But God's grace is upon them. And God always say that there is a hope. And put the hope in, you know, the even the judgment and say that, hey, if you obey God, you hear the word of the prophet, you will come back 70, year, 70 years later and, and praise and thanks be to God, it happened, all right? So that is the first picture, all right, about this, uh, about this, about this prince, huh? okay? Um, all right, uh, verse 14. Uh, verse 14, he says, I will scatter him. So, uh, okay, uh, verse 14. And, and I will scatter towards every wind all who are around him, his helper and his troop, and I will unsheath the sword after them. So God is going to punish them. Now, very interesting. Look at the verse 14 and the verse before that. Verse 14, suddenly there's a shift in the language. Look at the language. And I will scatter towards every wind all who are around him, his helper and his troop, and I will unsheath the sword after them. And look at verse 15. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And that's the verse. When I disperse them among the nations. Verse 14 and 15 suddenly switch a little bit, talking about the troop, talking about the, the prince, and then suddenly in verse 15, it moves towards 
I will disperse the nation. Now, who is he talking in verse 15? The exile. And who is he talking in the future judgment? You see, the prophetic uh, word has many layers. He's talking about the nation. So who is going to be scattered? The nation. Who is the nation? The nation around us. If we don't obey, we'll be scattered. This prophecy, yes, is fulfilled in the days of Ezekiel, but it is multiple fulfillment is going to come. And I believe it's going to come in our day. So he says, so that they know that I'm the Lord and I will disperse them among the nation and scatter them among the countries, but I will let a few of them escape. Now verse 16 is the remnant. It's you and me, okay? I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine, from pestilence, and they may declare all their abomination among the nation where they go and I and may know that I am the Lord your God. I'm Yahweh. Again, in verse 16 and in verse 15. Twice in this verse, I am the Lord. They must know that I am the Lord. You who are remnant must know that I am the Lord. So how are you going to carry the word? Are you going to do the sign act like that uh, of Ezekiel if you are called to uh, give a hard message to the people? Okay? Now, let's look at the second picture, the second sign act. Okay? Um, okay. Now, this is the explanation of the first sign act. Okay? I already given to you. The second sign act is um, in verse 17 and verse 18. All right? 17. Uh, sorry, verse 18 uh, onwards. Huh? Verse 17 onwards. Sorry. Verse, verse, eight, uh, verse 17. Sorry. Okay? And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, eat your bread with quaking and drink water with trembling and with anxiety. So there's a scarcity of water, scarcity of food. So eat it with trembling, with anxiety. And say to the people of the land, Thus say the Lord God concerning the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink water in dismay. In this way, her land will be stripped of all it contains on account of the violence of all those who dwell in it, and the inhabitant city shall be laid waste, and the land shall become a desolation, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Okay? Now this is what it is. The prophet is asked to act out uh, eating very little bread, very little water is a sign to Jerusalem that things are scarce. No more wheat to make the bread. No more water because water is going to be cut off. All right? um, so this is what is going to happen. So everything is going to be stripped off. The inhabitant city is going to be destroyed. The land is going to be desolate. And Zedekiah and the crew and the residents of Jerusalem, um, you know, hopefully and praise, uh, uh, hopefully that they know that I am the Lord if this sign had happened. So, so, so this, this is what it is, the second sign. So now we see how the people respond. Now to see the response, uh, you will see that in verse 21 all the way to the end. See how, see how they respond, okay? And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, what is this proverb that you say? We read this already, okay? Uh, what is this proverb have to, uh, that you have about the land of Israel saying the days grow long and every vision is nothing? Tell them if they say this. If they have this perception or they have this saying in them, or the false prophet has come and tell them this. Thus said the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. Tell them this is not true. Now, what is the idol that the Israelites have set upon themselves? Number one, the idol in their heart. Maybe those foreign gods that they vow to worship. And in chapter 7, uh, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11 talks about those idols. Now, chapter 12 and 13 talks about another kind of idol. The idol of people, the idol that comes in the word, false prophet, coming to tell you, hey, it's not going to happen. God is going to bless you. God is not going to punish you. God is not against you. God is for you. That is the message, the counter message that Ezekiel is preaching because God said Ezekiel is praying that God is going to judge you the end is going to come so that idol can be false word and also can be the idol that you bow down to so today let's put it today to a text money, sex, power you can bow down to it uh, false teaching false preaching false prophet coming telling you about what is going to happen don't worry God will save you I mean, message like this. If you know that they are false, 
then you have to take heed. So these are idols. So you see that from verse uh, chapter 6 onwards, all the way to chapter 13, even 14, 15, and even up to chapter 19, he's talking about this idol that you have erected in your heart and in your hearing and your believing. That's why you cannot see when the word, the truth comes, or you cannot hear when the, when, uh, when the truth is being uh, told to you. So therefore, they are responding it like that. They say, no, no, we have heard, maybe our prophets have told us that nothing to worry because these prophets say the days are long, every vision shall come to nothing. And tell them that, thus say the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb and I shall be no more, and I shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near and the fulfillment of every vision. Tell them that it's going to come. Okay? Verse 24. For there shall be no more any false vision or flattering di divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord. I will speak the word that I will speak and I will be, uh, perf uh, that I will perform. It will no longer be delayed. But in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord your God. God is telling them it will happen. Whatever I say, whatever I threaten you, whatever I have against you, it will happen. And how many times already he said, does say the Lord, the first act, twice, the second act, once, and here again, after the people respond that, you know, no problem, it's not going to come, and he says, you tell them that I am the Lord, I will speak, and this will happen. So four times, one, two, three, four times already in this chapter alone that I am the Lord. What is he trying to tell the people? I am the Lord, not your idol, not your false prophet, not those things that you hear. I am the Lord. You've got to hear what my word. I am going to punish because you have sinned against me. Let's read on, okay? Verse 26, And the word of the Lord came to me again. You can actually detect how many times the word of the Lord came to him. Even the Lord, but the word of the Lord came to him five times. They never listen. They never hear. They never see, okay? The word of the Lord came again. Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel, the vision that he sees is for many days from now, we read already, and he prophesied of times far off. Therefore said to them, God always answered them, okay? Thus say the Lord God, none of my word will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. It will come, it will come. There is, there is going to be no more false vision, flattering or divination, no delay. Verse 23 to 25. No more delay. God will perform it. Verse 27 to 28. So from verse 20, uh, from verse 21 onwards to 27, the message that God is telling us, if the timetable is here, then there is no more delay. God is going to come in his wrath against the world. But thanks be to God, there is a remnant. You are the remnant now. Do, do the work of the remnant. But when you come here, will the remnant be affected? Yes, they will be affected. But God will protect them. As He has mentioned in the past, in all the chapters that we have read, a remnant I will preserve, a remnant I will keep, a remnant that I will, you know, um, uh, 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 cover them, you know, and, and shield them. Why? Because the remnant is the one that is going to tell them about their abomination. They are still work here in the time of judgment, but the time of judgment is going to come. So whether you take it as now is already the time of judgment or not, or there is another future of, ju of judgment, I think, I think that now is the wrath of God is already being poured forth in many ways. But have we seen the, the peak of the judgment or the peak of the wrath? I, I think there is still the grace. So therefore, brothers and sisters, let's not take this grace for granted. Let's continue to live in grace and preach the word of God in grace, okay? So, so that's how I think the book of Ezekiel is so powerful for us today. Okay. Now, the problem, disbelief. Eyes that see, eyes, they have eyes but don't see, ears that they don't hear. The disbelief cost them everything. So I pray that you do not have this disbelief. But ask of yourself that if you are called to preach the word, do you disbelieve in the prophetic uh, vision that God has given unto you? Do you disbelieve the word of God for maybe a brother or a sister or a church or whatever? So, so disbelief can cost us everything, whether we are believer or non-believer. So therefore, brothers and sisters, how can you know for certain the word of God is to read the word of God? 
is to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help you, okay? God warns the people and Zedekiah. Many warning, and God is warning us today, again and again, through the preaching of the word and through, the, through your own reading and through God's prompting of the Holy Spirit. God is warning us, question, do we heed the word and be faithful to speak the word? That is you. Okay? Zedekiah disbelieved. Jeremiah 27, 1 to 22, you can go back and read. Or 38, 14 to 28. Even Zedekiah do not believe. He said it's not going to happen when Jeremiah spoke to him. Remember, Jeremiah is also preaching almost the same time with Ezekiel. So Ezekiel also tells the people, but the people don't believe. So Je Jeremiah tells us of the, the prince that don't believe. And here, he says what is going to happen to the prince. And when we come to chapter 17 and chapter 19, we're going to see a prophecy re uh, related to this prince, Zedekiah. And how he was, he's been pictured as the two eagles. And then how there's going to be a, a, a funeral song that's going to pray for him. That means he's going to die. So, but yet, in the preaching of Jeremiah and in the preaching of Ezekiel, he doesn't believe. And so is the people in Ezekiel 12, Ezekiel 13. So, um, what, they, what I think uh, and what I, as we read this, many people will believe in the lies of the devil. And sometimes we also think, well, the devil will put uh, things in our head and we believe. Um, like, for example, in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, remember the devil tells Eve, he says, No, you will not die. And I think this is what is coming into our, our, our head and our mind today. No, you will not die. If you do this, no, you will not die. That's what the devil tells Eve. You take the fruit, no, you will not die. Did God say? These are things that always come. Did God say this? No, you will not die. So don't worry. That is the message of the false prophet. That is the message of the idols in their heart that has caused them to be so hard, hard hearted. You know? You will not die. But Jeremiah, now we like to read Jeremiah 29, 1 to 29 and say, um, you know, God has a purpose and a plan for you. Remember that verse? Uh, he has a plan to prosper you, not a plan to, you know, uh, destroy you. But you, do you know that that whole verse, uh, that whole chapter, chapter 29, is talking about God's discipline. Now, don't take the word of God out of the context of the Bible. Always read the context of the Bible. The context is discipline. But in the discipline, he wanted to preserve. That's why he says, I have plans to prosper you, to give you a hope. Yeah, I, I'm a prophet, I give you a hope. That verse comes in the context of God disciplining his people in Jeremiah. But nothing wrong to use that verse and say, God will prosper you, brother. God will, you know, God will make you a nation. Uh, God, uh, God has a plan for you. It's not to destroy you. True enough, that verse is true because Ezekiel tell us that God has a remnant. That's how he's going to preserve. But this remnant, this preservation, this hope is going to come in the midst of trouble. A midst that the world is, that world, that time is going through punishment and the world that people do not believe in God and God wrath is upon them if they continue to do so. A lot of the prophetic word come in this context. So therefore, brothers and sisters, we must heed this uh, message of the Lord that God is disciplining His people. His wrath is not to destroy you, but His wrath is to refine you. The wrath is necessary for your salvation. The wrath is necessary for the salvation of the people. So don't look at, while well, God is angry. He's angry, but angry in, in uh, hope, angry in, uh, you know, wanting to save you. You got to read the prophetic message like that of the Old Testament, and it carries to today. Praise the Lord, okay? So, so this belief will cost you everything. So brothers and sisters, check your heart. Is there any disbelief there, okay? What else? Obedience. We must be obedient at all costs. I did as I am commanded. There must be a great sense of urgency. It is now. Remember the prophetic timetable? Now, God is grieved. So what, what can I do? See it as an opportunity. 
that every day in your life God gave you one person that you can meet one soul that you can talk Jesus to you know see as a furniture to preach because I believe that if you have the message in you when you always preach to yourself when you have the message of Jesus in you then I believe that, that then you will be able to open your mouth and preach I always say that you always preach to yourself first and then you preach to others which is always true God has given you a sign act and that is the cross his birth his miracle birth and the resurrection and if you have this three sign act you can perform that sign act in the day in, in, in your daily life and then I believe that you can see it as an opportunity to reach someone because God first preached to you and you preach to yourself and say I believe in this it's not in the disbelief I must be obedient to know that God has done this for me I'm not worthy but God has given me so I am going to tell someone who is unworthy that, that she or he is worthy okay uh, delay obedience is disobedient never mind let brother Wong do lah. let sister Galilee do let brother Justin do I don't need to do because they are gifted man. they are evangelists God called them to be somebody so they do delay disobedient is disobedient if God calls you to do you be, you be obedient you don't say oh maybe some of you say oh not now let me retire first four years down the road God I will have all the time for you when the time for you to retire you will not have time for God so I'm trying to tell you that don't delay now is now what matters is today you do not know whether you have tomorrow so a delay disobedient is disobedient to God so what about us now I'm challenging you I'm challenging myself okay uh, God does not just have a word for yesterday or tomorrow but he has a word for today so I I urge you as child of God as son of God as daughter of God as prince and princesses of God you have the greatest sign act and while you were yet still sinner God came and died for you and therefore you are going to perform that act out as like Ezekiel not to lie on the left or right God did not call you to do that but God asked you to be obedient okay so the two words that I want you to think through today is this the disbelief and obedient one start with D one start with O so what is that do so go and do all right be obedient to God okay all right so the breaking point here is we pause and ask is there any word of the Lord that we do not believe is there anything that we don't believe check the unbelief in our heart is there anything that has drawn us away idolatry or false prophet word or idol that we have erected is there something he has said that we are struggling to receive and we choose to believe something easier if he give you a message of judgment and tell a brother or tell someone after praying you think that is the word of God do you uh, they say okay I don't want to offend him so I don't tell do you choose the easy way out no if a word is given to you you tell just like how the word is given to Ezekiel is there anyone who is being impacted by our disbelief is, is there any disbelief in me that has that I have created or, or I have caused a brother or sister to fall that we uh, okay is there any anyone who is being impacted by our disbelief that we don't obey and preach the word hopefully others are being blessed by our belief and our our faithfulness in receiving the word and not burden people with our disbelief all right so so take note of this word okay now Ezekiel 13 now as we come to this point um, are you okay so far so good okay can understand right quite easy two acts he's gonna explain and then he's gonna tell them that God uh, that how uh, he's going to challenge you and how you're gonna respond to the word he's telling you that the people may not respond to the word people can be hard-hearted but what about you do you have any hard-heartedness in you do you need to take note of all these things in your heart do you need to repent do you need to by all means preach the word of God and he tell again the, the sign act in this in this chapter remind me again and again that we have the greatest sign act and we are supposed to be the sign act. so if you are asked to do these things to preach the gospel of Jesus birth cross and resurrection are you shy about it are you going to preach to people are you going to not do it I pray that you will be able to overcome some of these things 
and obey God and do the things that God wants you to do. Okay, so chapter 13, I just summarize it for you. You can, you can go back and read, okay? But it's very simple. He's going to tell you that idolatry is not just the, you know, just the idol that you, that you erect, but it's the false prophet that is coming through. Now, this is a very big thing in the days uh, of uh, Ezekiel. And he's going to tell you that the false prophet is going to be condemned. Now, from verse 1 to 7, he's going to tell you that the false prophet will be judged. Why are they going to be judged? I'm going to summarize it for you. They invent their own prophecy. They prophesy according to their own imagination. They have seen nothing at all. They don't see anything, but they say they see something. They are like jackals among the ruins. You know jackals? Uh, you know uh, jackals, okay? They are like jackals. Jackals are very possessive, okay? Um, they are not repairing the war and they are not standing firm in battle. So they don't help the people. They, they are telling the people, you know, uh, things that is otherwise. They don't help them to build. They are telling people of another message. Lies and false vision, and God has not spoken to them. So this is the, roughly what is in the gist of verse 1 to 7. Is that they have their own word instead of the word of God, and God is going to judge them, okay? And then verse 8 to 10, He's going to tell this false prophet that I am the sovereign God. Okay, in that sense, he's going to tell them that I am the Lord again. Okay, look, look what he says. If you are, if you have this, I will stand against you. Okay, um, I will raise my fist. God said, I'm like a you know, tyrant, I will raise my fist against you. I will banish you from the community and you cannot set foot on the land. And you blot their names from the book. And what book is this? This is obviously the book that God has. Okay, it's, it's written there. This is the punishment if you are a false prophet. So check your message. Whether the message that you are supposed to give, is it from God or not? Okay, and then I teach you how you check your message. Okay, now then he says, now he's going to talk about the false prophet and he's going to say, hey, you are a whitewashed wall. He says, you preach false peace. You say there's going to be peace where I say that no, there's no, no more peace because judgment is going to come. You are whitewash covering flimsy wall. You are putting a whitewash to cover that flimsy wall and make it as though as it's strong. But it's, the foundation is very weak. So you have a whitewash wall. Knocked down by the rainstorm. If the rainstorm comes, you will fall flat. So the word that is not from God will fall flat. God will send a storm, a flood and hailstorm and he will not fall down. Found this, I think that maybe I can, okay, I can take it on face value that I can believe. I can take it face value, okay? Now I will say, yes, I will listen, okay? So how he handles the word? If he is a person that don't handle the word properly, do you believe in him? No. See how he handles the word. See what God, uh, you, you will know him he's, if he's from your community. Now, the New Testament always say test the spirit. And I would think this is the best test. Whenever I give you a word, you test me. I, 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 uh, you go and say, God impressed upon my heart, brother, this is the word for you. Then I will always tell people, please test that word. See it come true in your life. If it doesn't come true, do I call myself a false prophet? No, I don't. But if I am holding on to my lifestyle and I handle the word correctly, then I am just a prophet or, or just a person who may be misread and who thinks that this is from the God, but it is actually from me. So that, do I then go on and prophesy? Yes. Why should I give up prophet, uh, prophetic ministry if God gave me a prophetic ministry and I prophesy and, 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 and it doesn't happen in your life? I would say that the prophet now and the prophet before, I would think that the prophet before uh, has um, higher authority than the prophet now because the prophet now, although they come and prophesy to you or release a word of blessing to you, but yet we still need to test. Even those days we need to test. But here, if we do something not right, then obviously I don't think we are false prophet like that being mentioned here. You understand what I'm trying to say? We are not, just, we are not to be brand here. As long as we meet some of these criteria, the lifestyle, okay, test the spirit, uh, is it based on God's word? That's very important. I cannot say against God's word. Uh, confirmation from others. If I give you a word, can you confirm with others? Or maybe if I give you a word and then suddenly someone tell you the same thing, and that's confirmation, all right? So confirmation under. Don't be jackals here, okay? 
jackals among the ruin, okay? Um, you always think you are possessive and, and things like that. Um, don't be a whitewash wall, okay? Don't give people a foundation that, will, that, that is easily crumbled and just plaster it with whitewash, okay? Uh, you got to die to self. And there's opportunity you got to speak against false prophet. If you know that there's a false prophet and people giving you word uh, that is not according to the scripture, then you can say, yes, I don't think that brother is uh, doing the right thing in giving that prophetic uh, word or utterance unto you. So the, the thing is that I don't think that you need to stop prophetic ministry. In fact, you should do more. Because it is at this time God has called you to preach the word and to encourage and to, uh, to strengthen and to bring people to Christ. If a word of God given to you, very clearly, you go out there and you say, I will always use, I have an impression from God, brother or sister, that this is the word of God for you. I, I, I don't want to use, thus say the Lord. Because I think there's a very, that word is reserved for the prophet of the old. Thus say the Lord. Because I believe that you say, thus say the Lord means, the Lord say it. But if I come on Eric Mao conviction, after much prayer, after much seeking, and I say, I have an impression for you, it is also a prophetic utterance from the Lord in warning you, in giving you whatever God wants to speak to you, but yet I stand to be tested on my prophetic utterance. You understand? I stand to be tested. And if I'm wrong, I'm not a false prophet, but I'm just, okay, a person who maybe, you know, I, I make a mistake in this, but fine. I go to another person, I continue to do what I, I faithfully do. And I believe that if you have a prophetic calling, you cannot do 10 and 10, you get wrong. I don't think so. God, in His sovereign grace, will give you the word. You must not be like them. Imagination, see nothing but tell, uh, lies and false vision, you know, um, and all this. If you have this in your mind, then obviously you are wrong. So you must know that, hey, if you have really a word from God, you've got to tell. If you delay disobedient, then a delay disobedient is disobedient. If you have a word and you don't tell, I hold it in your hand, like Ezekiel. He says, if you don't tell a brother, then I hold it in your hand. You, um, you hold it, you know, as a responsibility in your hand. Because if you don't tell, and something happened to the brother or the sister, then you are responsible. But if you tell, and something happened to him, then you are not responsible. I think that word is very powerful to all of us who are in prophetic ministry. If God gave you a word, don't delay. Go and tell. But tell it in a way that God gave you grace. But you, much prayer is needed, much seeking of the Lord is needed. That's why I say the lifestyle of how a person handles the word is absolutely important in prophetic ministry. Now, if prophetic ministry is so difficult, should we still do prophetic ministry? Yes. Because you are called prophet. Isn't it that Jesus, God said, when the Holy Spirit is poured forth upon you, what, what the old man should do, what the young man should do? Young men shall see vision, old men will, shall, she, shall, see, uh, shall dream dreams. And I believe that the prophetic vision is going to come forth forward to you as a Christian and you are always uh, 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 and you are so important because as the prophetic calendar is ticking what is important is now are you going to tell the word of God to those who needed it so this is chapter 13 if I would summarize now from chapter 8 all the way to chapter 13 what is Ezekiel telling? Judgment is going to come. Then you must know that I am the Lord, not the idol that you erect, not the high places that you have put hope into. Chapter 6, chapter 7. Chapter 8, 9, 10, 11. The idol that you put in your heart, the idol that you, that you bow down to, those are things that you need to take away. And then chapter 12, continue to speak of uh, the siege, the, the, the two sign act, and how people will respond to the very word of God. And then in chapter 13, he's going to tell you, either does not come by all those things that you bow down to, but it can also come by those who are preaching wrong things. 
uh, false prophet, wrong word, you know, and, uh, and, and say, just say the Lord, type of thing. So, what is Ezekiel telling them? If you don't repent, if you don't throw this idol out of your heart, whether it is false preaching, false prophet, or the idol that you erect, that you bow down to, then judgment is going to come. So, brothers and sisters, we are still in the era of grace. I would say limited grace because God is grief. God's timetable is getting closer to the end. So question that I challenge you and myself today is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? How do we respond to God's word today? Take that word and may that be, the word be a prophetic word to be able to utter that word in season and out of season for this season now, for the people that we love, for the people that is that do not know God. And how would people respond? If people respond negatively, which they will, like the day of Ezekiel, are you going to give up? Are you going to disobey God and say, okay, God, um, it's not, I mean, it's not for me. No. If there is, if you meet a wall, if you meet a, a, a hurdle, then God say, press on, just like Ezekiel. You, because you are sent to a rebellious house, and it's true that the world today is rebellious. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word in chapter 12 and 13. Father, we thank you, Lord, for teaching us how should, we should respond to your word. Father, there, Father, there are time, Father, time and again, Father, Lord, that you have given us word uh, for your people. And Father, the greatest message that you have given unto us is the word from our Lord Jesus Christ from the cross, his miraculous incarnation of God being man, the presence in our life, and the resurrection. Father, we are asked to do this sign act of you in the world that you have placed us to be because, Lord, the world is, uh, is in the brink of judgment. But yet, Father, we believe that in the judgment there is hope. Because it is in the judgment, Father Lord, that you, bring, you will bring salvation, not only to us, but to the people that, is, that we love. And Father, you, it is in your heartbeat, Father Lord, that you love them and you want them all to be saved. Father, we are your vessel. We are the Ezekiel in our time. The Father, you have sent us like an Ezekiel into our offices, into schools, into the church, into the community. The Father, we are to act out this sign act, Father Lord, as Ezekiel acted out, Father Lord, in portraying the message. Father Ezekiel points, Father Lord, to the salvation, to the, to the, uh, to the hope that, Lord, that you are going to bring to the people. But Father, we who are seated here comfortably in 2024 already know that, Father, that Jesus has died for us. We have witnessed the cross and we know, Father Lord, uh, of what uh, you have uh, done for us. Father, you call us ambassador, ambassador of Christ. So, Father, as ambassador, Lord, we are representing you. So, Father, teach us how we should represent you, Lord. Teach us how to preach your word. Father, we thank you and we praise you. The Lord, that we know that when we want to preach that word, when we want to do that sign act of you uh, coming for us and dying for us, and that this sign act of you is a salvation to many who is lost, Lord, we need to know the word. So teach us, Father Lord, to obey your word. Teach us not to disbelieve, Father Lord, the word, so that, Lord, that we are, so that we can be obedient, Father Lord, to walk the way you want us to walk. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the word. And we ask, dear Lord, that you also continue, Lord, to impart your prophetic um, vision and also your word to your people, so that, Lord, that they will have the word uh, to preach, to teach, and also to guide. Father, we pray that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will come upon your people, that Lord, that as they go forward from here, that they will speak prophetically, prophetically, Lord, to the dying generation. Lord, thank you for your word in the book of Ezekiel. And as we continue on, Lord, continue to inspire our heart so that, Lord, that we can know and we will know, Lord, our purpose and the plan that you have for us. So we give you thanks. And as we depart from this place, we ask for your tangible presence to fill us. Lord, bless us. Lord, guide us, Lord, lead us, Lord, teach us, and Lord, give us 
uh, the opportunity, Lord, to be able to preach your gospel as we walk out from this place. We give you thanks. We give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen.